Okay, we will get started and we are going to be doing product rule and quotient rule today. If you look in your book, this <coughs> is what the product rule looks like in your book. I think it's a little easier, personally, to do it a little bit differently. So I'm going to show you the way that I do it. If you have a function, if you have a function that is a product, It is the product of two smaller functions. Those two smaller functions have derivatives. So what you do is you take the derivative of the smaller pieces of functions And then you add the two pieces together and have them swap their derivatives. So f prime of x is going to look like this. It's going to be u of x plus, and actually the plus is part of the derivative rule, v of x, and then v of x's derivative is going to partner up with u of x, and u of x's derivative is going to partner up with v of x. And if you can do that first step, you don't have to do any algebra after that. Okay? You can do just the first step. Now this makes much more sense to do it in context. So we're going to actually get a, an example up here. And this is going to be a, kind of a short section because this rule, really the only way to learn it is to practice it. So here's our first example. We've got two, we've got a function, but that function is the product of two smaller functions. Smaller as in size, not value. So your first function here is that factor. And your second function is that factor. And those two factors have their own derivatives. The derivative of 3x squared is 6x. And the derivative of 2x plus 3 is 2 plus the derivative of 3 would be 0, so it's just 2. So when we get ready to do the derivative of the entire function, the way that we do it is we take 2x plus 3 times 6x, and then we take 3x squared times 2, and we just add those two together. And there's your derivative. This is the calculus. Everything after this step is algebra. This is the step you have to get right. 
If you choose to simplify it after that, that's fine. My math lab will, add, will show you how to simplify it. I don't necessarily require that you simplify it. I want to see that step. If you do simplify it, then you have 6x times 2x is 12x squared plus 3 times 6x is 18x plus 2 times 3x squared is 6x squared. So completely simplified, the derivative is 12x squared is 6x squared is 18x squared plus 18x. But again, this is algebra. This is not calculus. The place that you did the calculus was right there. Okay? Now I want you to try one. You try this one. Remember the conversion that you'll probably have to make so you can use your power rule. Your page has steps on it. If you'll identify what u of x is and what v of x is and then find those two derivatives, those extra steps will help you remember how to do the process that you're doing. Eventually, the goal is that you will look at that and be able to go all the first step without having stuff like that. But right now, you're learning the process. Okay, is everybody either totally stumped or totally finished? One or the other. Okay, let's do some identification here. U of X 
And I'm going to convert this as I write it down. U of x is this part. And I'm going to write that as x to the 1 half plus 3. The other piece of the product, the other factor, is v of x. And it's equal to x squared minus 5x. Now we need their derivatives. The derivative of u of x is 1 half x to the 1 half minus 1 is the negative 1 half plus 3. That's going to be plus 0, so you're probably not even going to use that. And then v prime of x, the derivative of the second factor, is x squared would be 2x to the first power. And remember, that's 1 times negative 5 is negative 5. x to the 1 minus 1 is x to the 0, so it disappears. So this is the two derivatives. Now you take your two factors. and you swap their derivatives. And then you add. It should, it should take the unsimplified form. Okay, now we're going to do an example of the quotient rule, and we're going to go look at my math, my math lab for a minute. Quotient rule is really similar to the product rule, because you've got a numerator, and you've got a denominator. The rule is a little bit different. What you start off with is the denominator times the derivative of the numerator. And it's not plus this time, it's minus. The numerator times the derivative of the denominator. So they still swap, but you subtract. And then you also have to take the denominator that you started out with and you square it. So let's see if we can put that in the context of a problem. Here's a quotient rule. Quotient just means it's a fraction. This is our numerator. And I use a little bit no different notation from what they do because I think it helps to remember the rule. This is the numerator. So then the numerator derivative is 2. This is the denominator. And the derivative of the denominator is 4. So then you start off your derivative of the whole function, knowing that it's a subtraction, and it still winds up with a denominator. 
So what you do is you take your denominator, which is 4x plus 3, and multiply it by the derivative of the numerator, which is 2. And then you take your numerator, which is 2x minus 1, and multiply it by the derivative of the denominator, which is 4. And then in the denominator of the derivative, you take the original denominator and you square it. That's the process. Okay? Now, you can clean them up, especially if you're going to want to evaluate something numerically. Sometimes you don't want to have to type in all those parentheses. So this will be 2 times 4 is 8x plus 2 times 3 is 6, minus 4 times 2x is minus 8x, and 4 times negative 1 is negative 4, but you're subtracting, so that's going to be plus 4. And since you have 8x minus 8x, then 6 plus 4 is just 10 over 4x plus 3 squared. But all the rest of that was algebra. That wasn't calculus. The calculus took place in the colored parts. Any questions? Now you can see this builds on your being able to use your power rules. You have to be able to use your power rule from the first section. And this is a big word of caution here, just as the derivative of a product isn't the product of the derivatives, the derivative of a quotient isn't the quotient of the derivatives. You have to recognize that the function contains a product or a quotient and use the appropriate rule. Now in the second step of example three, the one we just did, this is what we had. We had this expression. Don't cancel that 4x. You can't do that. That's not legal. That 4x plus 3 squared is under this term and this term. So you don't just wipe it out and say that it's not there anymore. Okay? Don't try to get fancy with your algebra. That's why I say do the calculus, and if you're not sure about the algebra, you might want to leave it alone. Let's try one more. Now, this is a combination of both, so we're going to have to be careful here. This is our numerator. But the numerator is itself a product. It's a product of two other pieces. So when we take the derivative of that numerator, we're going to have to be careful. Fortunately, our denominator doesn't have that kind of problems. Our denominator is fairly straightforward. So we'll take its derivative first. So the derivative of the denominator is 7. Because 1 times 7 is 7 times x to the 0 is 7. And the derivative of a constant is always 0. So the derivative of your denominator is 7. But in your numerator, you have the first factor, 3 minus 4x, times the derivative of the second factor, which is 5, plus the second factor, times the derivative of the first factor, which is negative 4.
And when you start to use these, since you're going to have to multiply the denominator times the derivative of the numerator, you might actually want to simplify that one just to make your life easier for writing it out. So 5 times 3 is 15. 5 times negative 4 is negative 20x plus negative 4 times 5 is negative 20x and negative 4 times 1 is negative 4. Negative 20x plus negative 20x is negative 40x and 5, 15 minus 4 is 11. So that's the derivative of your numerator in a much, much simpler form. You can keep it in this form, but you're going to be writing it all the way across the page trying to write out your derivative. So now we do the derivative of the quotient. And the derivative of the quotient is the denominator times the derivative of the numerator, which was this, plus, I'm sorry, not plus, minus, denominators are minus, the numerator, which is this whole big thing, times the derivative of the denominator, which was just 7. And then we're going to put that whole thing over the denominator squared. And at that point, the calculus is done. It's very ugly, but the calculus is done. The rest of it's algebra. 7x times negative 40x is negative 280x. Nine, negative 9 times negative 40 is positive 360x. I'm sorry, that first one was x squared because x times x is x squared. And then 11 times 7x is 77x. And negative 9 times 11 is negative 99. And then here we've got, let's just go ahead and multiply 7 times the last one. So 7 times 5 is 35x plus 7. And this is 3 minus 4x. So if I simplify that, that's going to be 3 times 35 is 105x. 4 times 35 is minus 140 x squared and 3 minus set 3 times 7 is 21 and negative 4 times 7 is negative 28x and I'm going to subtract all of those so that's going to be minus 105x plus 140x squared minus 21 and minus times minus is plus 28x. So we wind up with negative, one, negative 280 and positive 140 is negative 140x squared plus, and here I'm going to grab a calculator and add all four of those together at once. So we've got 360 plus 77 plus 28 and minus 105. So that's going to be 360 for all of these. And then negative 99 minus 21 is minus 120. 
and you can leave this just exactly like it is. So again, this is the calculus, the rest is algebra. I'm looking mostly to make sure you know how to do the calculus step. That's really what I'm interested in is that you can do the calculus step. So the calculus step is all right here. If that was a five point problem, four points would be that. And if I tell you to simplify it, then the simplification would be one point. The numerator is always negative. There's always subtraction. Just like in the product rule, the two pieces are always added together. <coughs> and if you think about it, when's the question? When's the question? Yeah, when it's a quotient, you're always subtracting in the numerator. And it's always the denominator that gets squared. But the thing to remember when you do this is since subtraction is not commutative, you have to remember to lead off with your denominator, not your numerator. Okay? That's important. You have to lead off with this piece, not with this piece. Because that will change all your signs and it will mess you up. Now, I think maybe a good thing to do at this point, if y'all don't have any objection, is to go on my math lab and actually do a couple off of there. Okay? So we can see that it will or will not take certain variations of the answer. So let's try that. And if you want to open up your my math lab and follow along, that would be fine. Okay, let me go find number 12 then. Okay. Let's see if I can get these side by side here. So we've got h of z, which is z to the 5.2 power, over z to the 6.2 power, plus 3. find the derivative, so the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative of the numerator <coughs> which would be 5.2z to the 4.2, right? Okay. 
Then we're going to take the derivative of the denominator. And since that's a constant, that derivative is going to be zero. And then to take the derivative of h, we know it's going to be a quotient. We know we're going to subtract on top. And we're going to square the denominator. So we start off with the denominator. And we give it the derivative of the numerator. As its partner. And then we take the numerator and give it the derivative of the denominator as its partner. Now at that point, actually, it should take that expression. It should. Let's see if it does. Now you do have to be careful how you put it in. So we start off with a fraction and get a set of parentheses. Okay, didn't want that, sorry. So we want z raised to the power 6.2 plus 3, close the parentheses, open a new set of parentheses, 5.2z, and it's And then we subtract, open another set of parentheses, z to the 5.2 times 6.2 z to the 5.2. I think I'm going to have to open it up some to be able to see the whole box. Okay, that looks good. So in the denominator we have z to the 6.2 plus 3, close parentheses, add your square. Yeah, it, it will. Um, try putting what, the one you have in front of you in right now.
in the program of programs in the condensed answer, but it's supposed to recognize the put with answers. Yeah, and you probably did just leave out your square because that's easier. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? Anybody else have any that they see they'd like to go ahead and do in class? Number okay. Okay, now we haven't done an applications problem yet, but we'll go ahead and do this one because I, I wanted to get the mechanics out of the way first. So let's go ahead and try this one. It says the total cost in hundreds of dollars to produce X units of a product is C of X is equal to that fraction. Find the average cost for each of the following production levels. Now the first thing you need to remember here is what does average mean? What does it mean to find the average cost? Take the total cost and divide by how many units. Just like if you were averaging your grade, you take the total of your points for your test grades and divide by how many tests you took, right? So this is just a formula for average. So that means that C average of X is going to be that, which I'm going to show you two different ways to write it. One, one way is a lot nicer than the other. The first way is to say that it's 7x minus 8 over 4x plus 1 all divided by x and that's ugly but remember if I take c of x and multiply it by 1 over x I get exactly the same thing That actually came up when we were doing limits. When it was inconvenient to divide by H, we just multiplied by 1 over H. Remember? So if we do that, then the average function looks like this. Four x plus one times x, and it's easier actually to go ahead and multiply that out, so that when we're taking derivatives, we don't have another product rule to deal with. So that would be four x squared plus x. So there's your average cost. There's your formula for average cost. And the first question says find the average cost for thirty units. So 7 times 22, let's get a calculator here. It's 154. 4 times 900 plus 30. Is... 3,630. And since doing the fractions on the calculator is easy,
we get 0 0.04242422. And let's see, X is in hundreds of dollars. For X units, then the average cost, and this is if I was asking you, not if they're asking you. The average cost of 30 units is, let's see, we'll change that in, into hundreds by moving the decimal, $4.24 per unit. Okay? Excuse me. Okay, let's take a different arithmetic approach and see if maybe I messed up some math somewhere. So the total cost would be seven times 30 minus eight over four times 30 plus one, which would be 210 minus eight over 120 plus one. Did you not square the Not yet. I'm actually gonna do the arithmetic way to do 30 years, to, to do 30 units. So then 210 minus eight would be 202 over 121 should be $81 total cost. And then if I take 81 and divide it by the 30 units, I should get the right answer. And it says it's 270. Hmm. Make sure I didn't mess up something else. Let me start back over. First of all, let me see if 270 is right. Okay, it's not happy with that either.
think I'm still coming up with the same thing. Hmm? Where? Right. Okay, let me try that. Well, see, that was what I was doing here. So let's try that again. 7 times 30, unless I entered something wrong. Minus 8 is 202 divided by 4 times 30 plus 1. And then you have to divide that by 30, right? By 1 or, well, you multiply it by 1 over 30, which is the same as dividing it by 30. It should be. Is that what you got? What did I do before? Because I obviously messed up the arithmetic before. Seven times 30 minus eight over four times 30 plus one, which came out to be 202 over 121. Yeah, I messed up the arithmetic before what I did. I don't know how I did it, but yeah, you're right. You're right. But you should get the same answer if you do it this way. I'm not sure why we're not. So that would be 556 per unit. So when it asks you to find the average cost for X units, you do have to do this, but I'm going to start from scratch and do that anyway. So the average cost is the total cost divided by X, so it should be this formula right here. So that should be, let me get this expression typed in there. Parentheses, 7x minus 8 for the numerator. Actually, I guess I didn't need the parentheses. Over 4x squared plus x. And then the marginal average cost function is asking you to take the derivative of this. And since that's quotient, the derivative of the numerator is 7. The derivative of the denominator is 8x plus 1. So that means that I'm going to start off with my denominator, 4x squared plus x times the derivative of the numerator, which was 7, so we minus. Use, I have a question. We use the original denominator, like the one that was given the problem, or the one with the squared? Like we don't use. You use the original denominator. times the derivative of the numerator minus the numerator, which is 7x minus 8, times the derivative of the denominator, which is 8x plus 1, all over that denominator, 4x squared plus x, 
quantity squared. So that should be the right expression. Now you can clean that up considerably, but it should take it just like that. And then I'm going to show you a little trick here at the end that will let you check and make sure you were doing it right. So C prime of X should be, or C average prime, that's the thing you have to be careful of is you're actually taking the derivative of the average, not the original cost function. It has to be the average cost function. So that's going to be 4X squared plus 4x, I'm sorry, not 4x, just x, times 7 minus 7x minus 8 times 8x plus 1, and in the denominator, 4x squared plus x, close parentheses, and then square the denominator. Now I'm just double checking my signs and everything to make sure I didn't copy anything wrong. Okay? So yes, even though that is ugly and even though you have to type in parentheses, if you don't want to simplify, it should take the unsimplified answer. To an extent. That better? I think I can go one more. It's just that it puts it way at the bottom and I can't make it move up. Okay? It still annoys me that it doesn't work trying to find the 30 units because if you're trying to find the average cost, you should be able to use the average cost function. Let's see. So there's the average cost function. Let me try that again. it should work. <laughs> and it did. So somehow I just messed up the math because you should be able to plug it back into your actual average cost function since you have to find it anyway. Okay? Now the big thing to remember on this problem because you may see one like this on the test is here again, watch your units. Watch the units. Watch the way the problem is presented because it's the total cost in hundreds of dollars. Okay? So you need to convert that answer into dollars because that's what the answer asks for is how much is it in dollars per unit. So that means you're going to need to multiply it by 100. Let's look at the other example that I've got and I think probably we'll be finished at that point because the other one, I, the other one I've got is about average cost. this. And the reason I want to make sure that we go over this is because this comes up quite a bit in business. Remember one of the things that I told you was to associate the word um, rate of change with derivative but you also associate the word marginal with derivative, okay? 
Anytime you're talking about the marginal cost, you're talking about the rate of change of cost. If you're talking about average cost, then that marginal average cost is the derivative. It's very important. Anytime you see the word marginal, you're going to take a derivative. If the word average is in there, then you're going to multiply it by 1 over x, whatever your cost function is. And that's going to be the same thing with revenue. Just because it's revenue doesn't change that. Your average revenue is your revenue function multiplied by 1 over x or divided by x. And the marginal profit function, the same thing. The marginal average profit, you take the average profit, which is p of x over x, and then you take its derivative to get the marginal average profit. And the reason that that's important is because a company is going to be interested in making the average cost as small as possible because the smallest cost means that you're getting more revenue ultimately because if you're having to pay less of the money you take in out in cost, then you're having more profit. So this is actually a definition in your chapter. It says the total cost to manufacture X items is given by C of X, and the average cost per item is then C with a bar over it, just like if you've had problem stats, you know that X bar is the mean. This is the mean cost, which is the average cost, and it's C of X divided by X, total cost over how many units. And if you want the marginal average cost, then you have to take the derivative of that expression. And that expression is always going to be a, a fraction of some kind. So you're going to need to be able to take the derivative of a quotient. So here's the example they gave us in the book. It says, suppose the cost in dollars of manufacturing X hundred small motors. So again, pay attention to those units. X measures in hundreds. And the cost is in dollars is C of X is equal to 3X squared plus 120 over 2X plus 1, but it's only valid for a certain domain. So it's not valid if you, if you um, have a cost of less than 10, for less than 10 hundred or 1,000 motors, basically, and 200 hundred is 20,000. So it's only valid from 1,000 to 20,000 motors, basically. So find the average cost per hundred motors. Well, that's just C of X over X. And when you take 3X squared plus 120 over 2X plus 1, and you want to divide that whole thing by X, it's actually easier algebraically to multiply it by 1 over X. So then your average cost function is 3x squared plus 120 over 2x squared plus x. So there's your average cost function. And that will be measured in dollars per X hundred motors, okay? I will keep that handy and go on to the next problem. It says find the marginal average cost, okay? That means we need to take the average cost and we need to find its derivative. So that derivative is going to be the denominator times 
times the derivative of the numerator so that would be 6x and the 120 is going to disappear so it would be just 6x minus the numerator which is going to be that 3x squared plus 120 times the derivative of the denominator, which would be 4x plus 1. And then that's all going to be divided by 2x squared plus x all squared. Now, if you want to simplify it, you can, but there is your derivative right there. I'm just going to kind of rearrange it a little bit. And since this is marginal cost, this is dollars per X hundred units. And the other way that you can interpret marginal cost, if you have a specific value for X, is it's the cost of producing the next unit, or in this case, the next 100 units. So this would be, if X was 30, 100, then it would be the 3,001st unit, for example, okay? It's the cost of producing the next one. And then part C says, as we're gonna see in the next chapter, average cost is generally minimized when the marginal cost is zero. And they want us to find the level of production that minimizes the average cost. So what that tells me is that we need to do is take the derivative of the average cost and set it equal to zero. So we need to set that big ugly fraction equal to zero, and it's not really as hard as you might think it's going to be. First of all, does it make any difference what the denominator is if the whole thing is going to be equal to zero? The only way the whole total cost, marginal average cost, is going to be zero is if the numerator is equal to zero. It doesn't, hurt, doesn't make any difference what x makes this turn out to be when you divide into zero for the numerator, then your marginal average cost is going to be zero. So you set your numerator equal to zero. Yes, 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 yes. Thank you, Katie. Plus one bonus point for Katie.
Okay, now, setting that equal to zero is going to be one mortal pain if I leave it like this. It's going to be near impossible to figure out what x is. So probably the best thing I can do here is to go ahead and multiply it out. So 6 times 2 is 12x to the third. 6 times x is 6x squared minus 4x times 3x squared is 12x cubed. 1 times 3x squared is 3x squared. And 4x times plus 12 is 120. Thank you. 4 times 120 is 480x plus 1 times 120 is 120. And I've got to subtract all of these from all of this. And when I subtract negative 12x squared from 12, or cubed from 12x cubed, that goes away. And then 6x squared minus 3x squared is 3x squared minus 480x minus 120. So you need to be able to solve that. And that is algebra, it's not calculus. How would you go about finding the value of x of that quadratic expression? Quadratic formula. I'm glad you said that because if you said factoring, I was going to say, oh God, <laughs> I don't want to factor that. Okay? You could factor it, yes, but quadratic formula is the easiest way to do it. So we would take the opposite of 480 is, or negative 40, 480 is 480 minus the square root of 480 squared. Hmm, I need a calculator. Two hundred and thirty thousand four hundred minus four times three times one twenty, negative one twenty. Is minus 1440, which is going to wind up being plus 1440. Over 2 times 3 is 6. So 2, 3, 0, 4, 0, 0, minus 1440. Take the square root. And subtract that from 480. What you subtract the 1440? Uh, I shouldn't have. I should have added it. Thank you. So that's 481. And if we subtract 481, this is actually plus or minus. If we subtract it, it doesn't make any sense, so we want to add it. So the level of production would be 160.25, and that would be 160 hundred motors. So that would be 16,000, okay? That would maximize your production. Or min I'm sorry, no, not maximize. It would minimize your marginal average cost, okay? So just round it to 16,000, round it to 16,021. Uh, I think I would just move the decimal three places and call it uh, 